like I said, we're going to talk a little bit about what you remember from science class. So I'm going to come out into the audience right now, and, and I'm going to ask a few people, what do you remember from science class? Let's see if you can. Oh, excellent. Bye. What do you remember from your science class? Pulleys. What did you do with pulleys? Oh, uh, we just took different sides. Showed how uh, the science teachers work. Effectively used pulleys. It was fascinating. Ninth grade. Ninth grade. What was in heaven? It was great. What else do you remember? I'm coming over to you. Observation of angular momentum. <laughs> the physics teacher tonight loves that. <laughs> You take a bicycle wheel and you reverse it, and then your 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 chair spins. It's kind of cool. While you're holding it. Um, in our class, there's some crazy physics masters. We were wired up to 132,000. Oh, uh, that was We were oh. wired up to 132,000 volts. The whole classroom, and you just everyone's shaking their muscles and <laughs> just going crazy because nobody could believe you put 132,000 volts through people. Was it was this in England by chance? Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, great, great, great science. <laughs> you can pretty much do anything. It sounds great. I was amazed how taking the lid off a sterile petri dish for just a few seconds and putting the lid back on, how so much bacteria grew within a 24-hour period. And so it helps me keep half and half bottles closed, you know, all, all those things on the tables you see, all the milk things open, no, I close them all the way. Anyway, lots of crep in here. All right, bacteria in a petri dish. What else does anyone remember from their science class? I'll, I'll tell you what I remember since no one else is right there. I remember a uh, moment in chemistry class where my professor, he drew this excessive molecule on the board. It was called Taxol. It's a natural product that's used to treat breast cancer. And he drew this massive molecule on the board. And then he was like, okay, what does this actually look like? And it's this big, huge carbon web. And when he asked what did it look like, like I remember it was almost like a drug trip. I could actually see it kind of coming out of the blackboard a little bit. And I could picture it. And it was the first time I really remember connecting with science in a way that like made sense to my own brain. And I happened to go out and get a chemistry degree and I'm involved in science still to this day. And that's one of those moments that like crystallized for me of what I take away. And the theme that I keep hearing everyone mention is is they remember doing something. No one remembers the lecture they got on the periodic table or de Broglie's theory or looking at the uh, looking at fossils of a trilobite or the scary snake which is here somewhere. <laughs> so uh, I, I see that as a theme, and I'm wondering if, uh, as we talk to these gentlemen tonight, if that theme continues to emerge to this day. So I want to introduce three men. First is Dan Sudrin. He's founder of Mission Science Workshops. He's up here. He's going to talk to you in a minute. This is Zeke Cossover, sans beard, if you've ever seen him before at a science cafe. He's science department chair at the Jewish Community High School of the Bay. And this wonderful gentleman here in the orange hat is Chris. <laughs> Runs Tree Frog Tracks, uh, which is an experiential learning center for children. And he brought in a snake, which I'm terrified of. So I'm going to stand a little over here. So uh, we are, uh, I'm going to start with, Rachel's going to introduce herself in a few minutes. I won't forget Rachel. So we're going to start off with Dan. Dan's going to tell you a little bit about himself, and then we're going to go down the line, and we're going to go to science class in a few minutes. So, gentlemen. Hello? Oh, is that me? <laughs> so my name is Dan Sudrin, and um, you all have a handout. We were fortunate enough to get an article in the Chronicle about what we do at Mission Science Workshop. And I also added to it a little map so y'all can come in 
to the workshop because um, I think if you're here, you'd probably really be interested. It's just down the street. It's, we're in the northwest corner of Mission High School in the old auto shop, which we've converted into a sort of a neighborhood exploratorium slash workshop laboratory place to explore and discover. But anyway, guess what? I, I'm, I'm kind of challenged here to figure out how I can share in this kind of a physical setup. I'm used to long tables and a lot of kids. We mostly do K through 10, so this is a very, I'm like a fish out of water here, but I'm trying to swim, see how well I can swim here. <laughs> anyway, I actually live, uh, I've lived for uh, 22, 23 years near the corner of uh, 21st in Florida. And that's where I started the workshop in my garage. And I actually had very negative experiences with science all the way through. And was, I mean, I, I was a good student, but basically science, I figured I'm just not smart enough or I just don't get it. So I was oriented toward social science, humanities, went to University of Chicago, got my degree, went to law school. Ended up becoming an organizer with Cesar Chavez in the 70s. I, I'm bilingual, so I did a lot of organizing. And, and then I kind of bombed out, of, burned out on that and became an electronics technician at City College. And that was kind of like my epiphany or whatever you call it. That um, I, I got fascinated by how things work. I mean, I had a BA and a, and a law degree, but I went back to City College to get an AA in electronics because I'd always envied kids who, and who had, kids who had parents who could change the oil in their car, which my father never could. Not, not to mention just anybody who knew how to fix anything, even uh, you know the hinges on a door in your bathroom. I don't know what, but anyway. So I finally, my dream came true after all this education, and I was fixing oscilloscopes and meters, and and I just it was a uh, kind of a trip for me because I began to wonder about how everything works. And then, um, so I started working in my garage, spent some time in the Exploratorium and just uh, fooling around and then the kids on my block started coming in and you know, wondering what I was up to because I leave my garage door open and ended up, the big thing that I discovered was how interested they were in science and doing the same stuff that I was doing. And, uh, and I, by that time I was getting pretty bored with my job having fixed the same brand oscilloscope for about the 50th time, kind of all the fun goes out of it after a while, you know, no matter how interesting the instrument is or the physics of the instrument. So then I thought, well, gee, the most interesting thing is about how you learn, actually the more interesting than science itself is how you learn science and kind of what it means to you as a human being in terms of the whole way, whole way that it can affect you when you think that you're starting to understand how something works. I mean, it just goes a, a way beyond all the science that I hated, and that I guess I still hate in a way, which is a lot of hieroglyphics on the board and a lot of yakety yak and, uh, well, you know, I don't want to get to <laughs> Yeah, that's a different I, cafe. That's not a science cafe that we're talking about. <laughs> anyway, um, so I would say what we try to do at Mission Science Workshop is, um, what I, I, one of my favorite quotes is from the physicist Richard Feynman, who said that, um, I believe he said this, I read it somewhere, <laughs> science doesn't teach anything. What? What? Experience teaches it, you know? And then he also said observation is the judge of the truth. And so the, I, I, I just go over the kids. Well, I think I start, I don't do that quite with kindergartners, but I would say as long, young as second grade, all the way to 10th grade, as I repeat that mantra, and, and they actually, they get it. It's amazing how they really get it, and they're really excited about it. Yeah, you don't have to be a genius, you have to... Observation is an art, and that's what the beauty of it all is about, not about all of this, you know, cramming knowledge in your head, and, and me as a teacher, I don't like cram knowledge into other people's heads, <laughs> just as I didn't like it crammed into my head. So the whole thing is that we, we try to create experiences that are strong and, you know, and they're spiritual. As you, as you all know who are into science, I think that it's a strong uh, human, human, humanizing experience when you get it the way it ought to be, I think. And I, the other thing I tell them is, oh, my other favorite is um, that I'm not, there's only one person in the world that I'm actually a science teacher for, who happens to be a person who actually works near Gary and Divisadero. I see him about once a week and once, <laughs> not once a week, not yet, <laughs> that's coming, once a year in his office. And um, he checks me out, checks my blood pressure, checks my heartbeat. I, I'm, hip, uh, I'm one of a number of his science teachers. I say, he is the only person to whom I'm actually a science teacher. Because these kids are sitting in Mission Science Workshop with the dolphin and all the stuff hanging from the ceiling. 
You say, these are all your teachers. That's why I've assembled all this stuff, because these are your teachers. I introduce you to your teachers. You know, I can help you uh, explore your teachers, but these are, and I, uh, my, I hold up this mole. I didn't bring the mole because I thought they, you all might be offended by a dead mole in a cafe. Maybe you're eating pizza. I don't know what. It's kind of <laughs> and anyway, so um, so the mole is your teacher, right? And I, actually, the mole. We learned so much about a mole just by looking at the mole and uh, observing it. And we didn't have to read a book. We didn't have to ask an expert. You know, and it was there. So so that's where it's at. So what I brought today is if there's any time left. I don't know. Maybe later. But anyway, what I brought today is I brought some bones. I don't know how we're going to deal with these bones. I basically bought four spines because I wanted to show you how this, the lower spine of a, uh, of a cow is... Uh, you know, I actually think the museums have it all wrong. They should, have, they should forget about the dinosaurs and just focus on moles, cows, and possums. I think those skeletons are much more interesting and educational for people living in San Francisco than dinosaurs because there's nowhere in the world you can find any living dinosaurs you know, as you know, you'd have to go back at least 60 million years to find me. But anyway, we have, I have these, um... So, actually, what, how about we do this? How about we have a volunteer who's not afraid of a cow bone, cow spine? It, I promise, it's dead. It's long dead. We have a volunteer. You want to meet Dan up here in the corner, and you're going to, uh, start the demonstration. In the meantime, We'll have uh, the other speakers introduce themselves, and we'll come back to how your spine is doing. <laughs> well, actually, what um, the thing about the lower uh, spine of a cow is that there's an absolutely beautiful fit between one ver the six vertebrae and the, the each vertebra and the next vertebra has a tongue and groove fit which is just like it locks in, which, which helps you understand how a, cow, how a cow moves when it's running, you know, it's sort of like this. It's not like a cat which bounds and, and bends its spine. And so you, you understand how it moves, you understand how it lives, how it eats, as opposed to a cat, let's say, at the other extreme. And, and by just putting that, she's starting to assemble it, I guess. We'll, we'll come back to you after the other speakers introduce yourself, so okay. we can pass it around. Okay. okay. I'm, I'm, oh, excuse me. So hi, I'm Zeke Kosover. I teach uh, ninth grade physics and 12th grade environmental science at the Jewish Community High School of the Bay. I have my dream job. I love being a teacher. Uh, and I will show you how my class is slightly different than the science classes you might have experienced when you were a student uh, a little bit later on, where you all get to do, uh, we have some experiments set up on tables around the room so that you all get a chance to have some experience doing some hands-on science. Well, thank you all for coming. I'm Chris Jordan. I'm the, uh, the director of Tree Frog Treks. And about 10 years ago, I decided to basically blow things up, light things on fire, and go out and find frogs with kids as a full-time living. And uh, previous to that, I was a college professor and then an elementary school resource teacher. And I really found that the two were linked, kids and college kids, fourth graders, community college kids, believing that they could follow their passions and finding a, a common bond with curiosity. I have a new baby, so I'm going to leave a little early tonight, but I wanted to show you two things that you can do at home really easily as a demo. So what we tell the kids is to face your face at the end of each program and take the Bill of Rights, where you promise to share your favorite thing, so that together we can save, preserve, and maintain our home by sharing what we know, like we're ready to blow. And who can be a scientist? Everybody. So Sarah here, right? Is that right? Did I get it right? Sanchez? Rachel. See, I just met her tonight. Rachel. Men, women black, white, purple, yellow, brown, really all need to be reaffirmed to be able to do science in our society because too many of us are white guys in a lab coat. So we ask them, what do you think a scientist is? And they look at their hand and every single kid, every single program says, I am a scientist and I can do what we call share what you know like you're ready to blow. So, <laughs> Oh, you're just diving into it. One, two, three, you snap it, lock it, and flip it, and you have this on their head, right? And this is a simple canister. And it's just full of a little baking soda and vinegar, right? So if I went up to Sarah right here and I said, share with uh, Rachel, share one thing you know, Rachel. What's one thing that you saw today, one thing that you know? Anything. What did you see today on the way here? So she saw that Sarah's going full of people, so we'd say to her, we're going to snap the lock in and flip it, and she's got something to share, like a knowledge rocket. Like a neuron fire. 
sign of rank. So. Very simple, silly, simple, simple film canister physics, but the most important thing for kids to remember is they need to share what they see, they need to wonder a little bit about it, and then they need to share what they know and collaborate. So another thing we try to do is push the limit on what is real and what is science. So we always ask them, is it magic? And they go, no, it's science, when they go to Tree Fog Treks. Is it magic? No, it's science. So young kids, we introduce them to live rescued reptiles and amphibians, and we brought a few up here today. But we also have them push the limit of their own sanity when it comes to doing things they're not quite sure what it is, like making water from fire or holding a hydrogen bomb in their hand. So this next one is what I'll do if I have time to do some experiments. And all you need to do is bubble some hydrogen gas in soapy water. And you can do this at you know, the safety of your own home by using uh, a metal and a strong cleaner, like um, Red Devil Lye, for instance. And you can actually hold these in your hand. And then you really get what we call an emotional connection to learning when you get a chance to hold that. And everything that Dan is doing is all part of the same thing too. So I knew he was gonna riff with some bones, but we have every program start with dead things. You make my heart you know, sing, right? So we have dead things in a library. We have live animal time where they get to connect to really feel a part of the whole cycle. And that is actually when the young kids, preschoolers say, oh, I can do science. And really they're just checking out snakes or boas or pythons or turtles or tortoises or worms, but then they know that they're ready to do science. So I'm going to sign off now because they've got lots to do, but if I bail on you, it's because I have a one-year-old at home that needs some attention. I want to tell you, we're so excited to be here. Thanks for coming. Anything else you want to say? I want to say, I want to say everything all, okay. all the time. I'm going to have you hold a, a little bit of this, okay? So scoop up some of these bubbles Please right don't now. put the snake in my hand. you got to scoop up the bubbles. <laughs> I just don't want the snake. So hold those up high. That was amazing. <laughs> Is it magic? No. Exactly. Alright, go ahead. Is there a, do you want to do something with that snake? Right now? <laughs> Get it away from me. <laughs> I'll walk it around. <laughs> so, can I pass around some skulls? Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay, we're going to pass around some skulls. Yeah, these are all, uh, all these bones, should I say? Yeah. Well, I just think the, all these bones were, uh, I got them. All these bones were um, found locally. Uh, there's a couple farmers who let me scavenge for, for bones who, have, who run cattle and sheep and goats. So actually, uh, I guess the point is that, if, that anybody could do this. You, I mean, you may say you have to be crazy, but... Um, Anybody who's crazy then can do it. You can live in the mission and do this in the city. You know, the bones are out there and, uh, you know, raccoon, there's raccoon, skunk, all of these are local mammals and herbivores. Anyway, so. I want you to play the scientist though, let me get away from that. And uh, tell me what, I'm gonna come around, we're gonna ask you what you notice about some of these skulls. These are everyday animals. These aren't velociraptors or, Tyrannosaurus Rex, or I don't even remember the other names, but uh, I, I want you to, to tell me what you notice about some of these animals as we pass around some skulls. Yes. And you're welcome to say it. Okay, well, um. <laughs> Sorry, you need a mic for that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, something else we've tried to do, you know, once you start collecting all these bones and you're, you're scavenging the farms and you're scavenging wherever, you're getting permits in the parks or whatever you have to do to get bones, and you start assembling them, you start noticing, aha, similarities. For example, we have a whole collection of femurs, which is your thigh bone. And uh, if you notice, this is one of, a, one of our, this is a human femur. And I didn't get that from a farm or a park. This is from Mission High School. Where we're like, and this is from a bobcat. But really, they're almost indistinguishable except for the size. You know, they both have a protruding ball that goes in a pelvic socket, and they're, you know, they're, they're just, uh, and, and we, we have all the way from ostriches to mice to even armadillo and a turtle. I mean, it's the same basic design. And that's true. With, um, we have scapulae, pelvises, and all these across a whole bunch of. So once you have your collection, then you start, then the fun starts. Which is kind of, you know, the same kind of fun that Darwin had and all kinds of naturalists have had. 
that um, you can have too. <laughs> you just need to, you know, go out and find find those bones, and I can show you how to clean them right here in the mission. <laughs> Without sp spooking your neighbors, and it takes a little. Uh, you have to be in good good terms with your neighbors, but you can work it out where you actually have your own. You can clean them all in your backyard. You don't have to uh, have Academy of Sciences. Clean all, right. all right, we're gonna find out live feed what you notice about that skull. Besides not wanting to touch it when you're eating your food. Oh, this is a this is a bird's a bird spine. So a long nose. Small brain. What do you notice about the teeth? Even teeth. No, okay. What is it? Then? Why do you think it's an herbivore? Because it has flat teeth. Let's hold it up and find out. So, hold up that skull high in the air, Dan. Yes. What kind of skull is that? Well, here are the notifications they gave. So they, you notice flat teeth, yeah. lack of canines, mm, capacity, uh, bifocal. Is that what you just said? So, what kind of animal do you think it is? Some herbivore is what they said. So what would you say to a child holding this skull? What would you have them notice? Just what he was, no well, he was noticing, the teeth and the, uh, well, yeah, where the eyes are, the teeth and where the eyes are, those are all great. I mean, um, I would not notice also similarities, the fact that it has an opening for the, spi for the spinal cord to come out. I guess we do a lot with the similarities. Also, that first vertebra, the atlas vertebra, which cushions, which cradles the skull, is, is very similar to, you know, the, even the sea lion or, the, or whatever. This is similar to a sea lion, is what you're saying? The atlas vertebra is remarkably similar, whether it's an herbivore or a carnivore, because that well, it's not, it's sort of not a specialized bone, because what's specialized more for carnivory or herbivory or omnivory <laughs> are the teeth. And the and the eyes in terms of predator prey, whether they're in front or on the side, and some of those things. Okay, so we're taking a poll. Not the I, expert at this. In, in one second. Yeah, uh, just go ahead. Pardon me. Oh. Well, let's see. What do I say? Sun, sun, water, and butts. But I prepare them organically since, <laughs> you know, I don't like to use chemicals. So it's, it's, a, it's sun, water, soaking and sun, soaking and sun, and then the bugs, when they're in the sun, the bugs are doing the work when they're in the sun, and they're back into the soak, and that just, you, that just goes on. Because we have a cow, and, and I actually let the cow sit on this ranch in Salinas Valley for over a year, and that's exactly what nature did, and it produced this very almost perfect skeleton. And I observed that it was just a combination of the rains and the hot sun. So I use an UV light sometimes in a box, which really heats up the bones. And it's also it also purifies them. There aren't many bacteria that are gonna stand, you know, dried out in UV in, in intense UV light. So So let's get some guesses. There's that big skull that just went it's right here. What do we think this is? Cow. Cow. Goat sheep. What where it's a horse. It's a horse. Why is it a horse? You're very dead like you know it's a horse. Because, because it seems like what you see in a western. And you think it's a donkey. Why do you think it's a donkey? there's a thousand skulls. It has a long snout, like it, like a donkey. It's a dingo. This fell off. So, Dan, what kind of skull is it? That's a sheep. That is a sheep. Who got that right? Hey, that's that's fantastic. It, 
But is uh, what I what I think is important to highlight is for as much as we guessed across the spectrum, no, only a couple people actually got it right, and no one definitively knew. Uh, but it's important to make the observations. Like somebody said, it was an herbivore for sure. That sounds like a sheep to me. Noticing how there was no carnivorous teeth or what a canine teeth. What else would you say people would notice about that sheep skull? Well, also, well, one thing I noticed, um, it's interesting that you don't, when you, has anybody ever gone to a sheep ranch and you know how cuddly the sheep are and then you, you might think when you put your hand out, well, you might think they would bite you, but actually, I think this is true of sheep, they actually can't bite you. Well, they have lower teeth, but they don't have upper, you know, incisors. And so they really don't, they don't have, they don't have any way to clamp down. It's just like they can kind of gum you from the top and they can, you know, they have teeth in the bottom, and I think goats are the same. So that's that's really interesting to me, because I never realized that until I started this collecting. And that's not crazy, but... So you want to talk about the spine of, of uh, the cow that's behind you? Yeah, well, um, I forget, I don't know your name, the woman who was helping. She was Sorry. putting together the... Uh, Oh, that's um, what do you? Well, first of all, what do you notice about the bird? Uh, well, it's large, very large. Uh, what other features do you notice about it? You click it off. What I see, at least, is is that the spine here seems stiff, except at the head, which where it seems to bend. Uh, be indicative of a larger bird, if where the larger birds don't bend, I don't know. Why? Why would they have a, a stiff back? What would that give them? What would a stiff back give to a bird? If that if that's true, they could stand up. What What do you think? I can stand up. Stability when they're flying. Well, first of all, does that jive with people, what people notice about the... <laughs> keep walking away from all my animals. Does that jive with what people notice about birds? When, they have, when you think of a pigeon, what do, you, what do you notice about their spine? I know everyone sees a pigeon, because I see a pigeon every day. <laughs> that it cur what do you notice about the spine of a pigeon? Curves where? On top of the neck and then out. It curves at the neck and then. Mm -hmm. What do you notice when they move? What do you see? Oh, they wobble. They wobble. What about their head and neck? What do you notice about the pigeon's head and neck? I'm not saying that's a pigeon. We have a video demonstration down here. <laughs> They're moving their neck back and forth, for sure. There we go, there, there's another video demonstration back here. <laughs> well, let's find out. Let's find out from the teacher. So, you heard a number of uh, comments about the, about the bird skeleton, about why, why they think it's stiff. Do you, do you have a mic somewhere? It's on the table. Well, I just, I just picked this stuff, I think, I, I want to make sure you know, I just picked this stuff up as I go. I mean, I don't have any, de I don't have no science degrees, and I mean, my, my mode of learning is just like, well, talking to people like you and then reading, well, I, and just as two weeks ago, I was reading this article about birds, and the reason I brought that is I hadn't actually looked at that bird spine I collected, I don't know how many years ago, I didn't even label it, which I usually do, but it was talking about how most of the, the vertebrae in a bird spine are fused. And that actually, if you look at it, it's fused all the way from the tail up to almost the neck vertebrae. So for example, a pelican, you know, it has this huge neck and it is flexible because they're moving up and down to fish, but the whole rest of the body, basically, or at least 90% of it, the spine is fused and stiff, which makes sense. There's space in the neck for a but not in the back. Yeah, it's all the way from... At least, especially like the lower back is, is all one piece. And the sacrum is, is fused into the lower what would be the lumbar vertebrae and then the pelvis. So it's very, you know, um, 
It works, so what it kind works of, for flying. What, what kind of bird is that? I didn't label it, I don't know. <laughs> That's the we best need a, part. We need a professor. Uh, <laughs> that is the best lesson you'll probably know. get today. It's a bird. You know, okay. <laughs> It's not about the answer. It's not yeah. that that's a great comment. I just heard up here. It's not about the answer to what is that skeleton. It's about the exploration of what do you see and observe. And I cannot think of a better transition to physics because you can't there are no answers in physics. <laughs> as as my high school <laughs> my college roommate who is now a uh, <laughs> postdoc in physics tells me there will never be any answers in physics, only more questions. So uh, Zeke's going to take us through an experiment, a physics experiment. Is this, is this on? Great. So I'm the one here who actually teaches formal science. I have uh, students who I torture every day. That was funny, you could have laughed. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Maybe it brings back bad memories. What I'm, I teach at a religiously affiliated school. I teach at the Jewish Community High School. So we, one of the major thrusts of my class is trying to figure out how you know what you know is true. I think that's one of the most important things in science is being able to figure out how you should believe what, what people tell you about science. How you should be able to uh, know what are the right answers. And for that, we start off with a lesson in optics, and I'm going to have you all be part of that right now. So you all have gotten a handout, which shows a light bulb and an eye. A light bulb and an eye on it. Um, and the little thing in the middle of the light bulb is the filament. That's the part of the light bulb that glows. Have you all seen filaments and light bulbs before? Yes. Great. So what I want you to do is I want you to spend about oh, 30 seconds trying to draw for me if you happen to have a pencil or a pen, and if you don't, you should come for more prepared to class. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't get a hand out, have some more. So there are more if you need them. So what I want you to do is to draw on it how you think light gets from the light bulb to the eye. Just to simply put down how you think it happens. You don't necessarily have the right answer. Some of you might, some of you might not. I just want you to put down how you think it happens. I'm spying them. I'm spying on them. Not many people are doing their homework. I saw a group back there passing a note. If you were in my class and you didn't do this, I'd have to slap you around. I own a sledgehammer and I know how to use it. Well, I think it brings up an interesting thing, which is the fear of being wrong. Oh yeah, a lot of people are concerned about being wrong about this. Don't worry, you probably are. It's okay, you haven't had any of the physics. <laughs> Actually, the worst part is the first time I did this it was with a bunch of um, optics uh, master's students. And uh, more than half of them had the wrong answer to this question, so that's, you really should feel okay about it. All right, so you've drawn what your idea is. I'm not going to tell you if you're right or not. We're going to figure that out in a few minutes. So if you'll turn the page to the first activity. I know it's in very small type. I also teach environmental science, so I felt like I couldn't waste the paper on you guys. You're not, it's, not that you're not, it's not that you're not important to me but I was afraid you wouldn't come. So the first activity says, you can see around the room there are light bulbs, lenses, they're just basic everyday. Thanks. They're basic everyday magnifying glasses, and then there's a screen over here. So if you would not touch them, that would be great. I'll direct you to the first bit of instructions that's in the little box. No, it's okay. I, it takes a while for you to get used to me. Um, so when, when we turn on the light switch, I want you to predict what you'll see on the screen. All I want you to do is write down what you think is going to appear on this screen right here. These people can't see it. Their backs to it. Hopefully, I'll have one up front that you all can see. Huh? It is. It's a plain old everyday white screen. A piece of cardboard I cut out from a student's project. 
It's a light bulb over there. It's a plain old filament light bulb, just like in the picture. So I'm going to cheat, and I'm going to ask somebody what they think they're going to see. And then I'm not going to write it down. What? Well, let people have a chance first to write down their okay. Yeah. You know. You'll notice that the first thing says what you think, and then the second one says what does the group think. That's what I do in my class. You first have to write down what oh. you think. And then the, then the group gets together and they discuss. This will be dull on YouTube, so... <laughs> All right, so people have now decided what they think is going to be on the screen. You've decided what you think you're going to see on the screen? They refer to consensus. What does this group think you're going to see? Uh, it's going to be a one point of green, white, and center. Red is going to be one. So we have one person who thinks there's going to be a very bright dot in the center. Not necessarily bright, be, but a single sort of... It'll be green, because that's a green light bulb over there, and it'll be a small dot. Do we have other opinions on this subject? So, so, so a person says it depends on how it was set up. I, of course, very carefully set it up, more or less. Um, uh, so you don't know for sure what it's going to be. But I, I set it up in an interesting way, so if you already know what that might be. Any other ideas for sure? Will you help me out? Yeah. Okay. Is there, do you have an idea of what you'll see? I've got an idea. It's going to light the whole screen up. Light the whole screen up. Any other, any other ideas? Dan, what do you think up front? What do you think you're going to see? <laughs> I can't. Dan, it's okay to be wrong. <laughs> My mind is a million miles. Oh, me, Dan? Been asking. Dan, what do you think you're going to see on the screen? I'm sorry, my mind is, is as elsewhere. Oh, okay. All right, so at this point, people have made their predictions, and so the time is to find out if you're right. So we're going to turn on the we're going to uh, turn on the light, and so you're now entitled to turn on the light and see what you see on the screen. So, for the people that can't see, what you guys can walk over and see what wow, you see. That's cool. What? Well, let's do a play-by-play. -play. What are you seeing? Oh, oops, sorry. <laughs> okay, here we go. <laughs> what do you? What do you see? Just the building. Just the building. What? Kind of like a play on you, like a little house. So it does sort of look like a house, don't you think? And it's in the shape of the filament. How many people thought that's what they were going to see? Raise your hand if that's what you thought. How many people are really interested in how this works now? The rest of you all are bored? <laughs> so you would see, so in this activity, it actually make a prediction and then you write things down and then we would go on to the, and then at the end of the activity, it asks you how you think this works. And if you were my students, I would sit you down and make you spend 10 minutes trying to figure out how you think this works. Um, hold that. You have to write it down. So I don't let the students tell each other what it is. I make them write it down. Because everybody comes into science class already believing things are true. You can't dissuade people from what they believe is true by telling them that they're wrong. They can only change it by having experience. They have to experience being wrong, and then they're ready to change the way they see how the world works. See, people are already doing experiments. They can't help it. If you grab them with something that's very eye-catching, then they will spend their time doing experiments even when you don't tell them to, especially students. All right, so you can see that there's a series of activities. I'm going to direct you past activity 1.02 all the way to activity, I think, 1.03. Can I borrow this?
And activity 1.03 asks you if the image is upside down or backwards. I would normally make my students turn off the lights again and then ask them to, ask them to make a prediction of what, it is, what it's going to be. It's amazing that they've just spent 15 minutes looking at this image and yet they cannot remember. What does that say? They've just been looking at it. So we've got to teach them, as others have suggested, about how to observe better, how to take data down. So, but you probably notice that it does look like it's upside down. The question is, is it also reverse left to right? Yes? No? So one of the ways to figure this out is you can take a pencil and put it right next to the light bulb, or your finger, but please don't burn yourself. And then you can move it side to side and watch what happens to the shadow when you move it side to side. So hopefully some people can notice or see it up here. They can watch the shadow go the opposite direction that the pin is. If the pin's going down, the shadow's going up. And if the pin's going left, the shadow's going right. I'll get out of the way. I encourage everyone, if you can't see, just join in on a table that has the experiment on it. Now if you turn the page, you'll see that the next experiment asks what happens if you move the lens. So I'll have you make, my students would have certain predictions about what would happen if they move the lens forwards and backwards. We don't have time, because Shore has not given me enough time to be able to do all of this experiment. Jerk. Do you, you <laughs> Sadly, that is not the first time I've been called a jerk. <laughs> but if you turn to, but you could, my students would make this prediction. We'd be running through, not this fast, making a prediction, seeing what happens, making a prediction, seeing what happens, trying to come up with an explanation about what's going on. Forcing students to commit themselves, and when they're wrong, that's when they're most willing to learn something new. Right? That's when we're all most willing to learn something new, when we think we know what's going on, and then we find out it doesn't work that way. All right, the next experiment I want you to do is 1.05, and that is what do you think you'll see? Yes. Oh, what would happen? Oh, go ahead and do it. Go ahead and move the lens forward and see what you get. Yeah. Let's get a play-by-play. -play. What do you think you'll see? What do you think will happen when they move the lens? <laughs> do you think it... Uh, this would be different if the light wasn't colored. What do you think? What do you? What do you think the lens is? Is it just? Is it just a magnifying magnifying lens? Is there anything special about it? It's magnifying the right. What do you, uh, when you see this happening, what does this remind you of in real life? It reminds me of high school physics. <laughs> but more fun. Alright, so we'll go on to the next activity, 1.05. That asks you what happens if you take the lens away. So I'm actually going to ask you to make that prediction right now. What do you think will appear on the screen, if anything, if we take the whole lens away? So write that down before you do the experiment, or at least make the prediction in your head. What do you think you'll see on the screen, if anything? So what, do we have some people who have volunteers who want to tell me what they think that they're going to see on the screen if we take the lens away? Yeah. So we have one vote for just light. Do we have any other votes, any other ideas of what you'll see on the screen? What do you think you'll see on the screen if we take the lens away? Paint behind you. Just a really faint green. Just a faint green? Possibly red, up with a different light color. <laughs> Anyone else up front that's had a chance to see it? What do you think you'll see? 
Red light. So I think the consensus seems to be they'll just see the light. Excellent. Let's move the lens out of the way and see if that's what's there. It's just light. Just light. All right, so once the students have done these five experiments, they're usually pretty ready to try to make and come up with an explanation of how light gets from the lens to the screen. So if you turn to 1.06, I finally made the page large enough to read again. And there's a picture of a filament and a screen and a lens. And I want you to try to actually make that prediction of how you can, if you've got a pencil, that's great. Try to write on it what you think, how you think light gets from the filament to the screen. decision for this, I and a lot of people are already look, but you might see that on the next two pages I have the most common ones that my students present to me. The first one is the one that's found in a great many middle school science textbooks. This one that says Model A. That's in a lot of middle school science textbooks. Model B is the one that I actually saw most commonly drawn in the classroom. This is the one that the Chronicle uses every time it tries to explain how an eye works. <laughs> this is the one they have every time. And it actually shows up in a bunch of photography textbooks too about how lenses work. C is the one that you, it looks like happens if you ever look at a projector in a movie theater. So a lot of students are fond of that because that's what it looks like happens. Uh, when they go to the movies. And then D is the one that's in my high school science textbook. Okay? So if you haven't already selected one, you can just circle one of these. But if you think it's a one different than those, then you can draw it in in E at the bottom. That's what I would encourage my students to do. Here's hoping that your textbook's right. <laughs> so I've always thought that English class ought to be an elective. <laughs> And science is the thing that should be required for four years, so my typos are purely my own. Now, here comes the hard part. Here's the whole build-up. It's just for this. Are all these models the same model about how light works? Are they all the same? The answer is... No. No, they're not, right? They're different from each other. How do we figure out which one of these models is a good model? Maybe even the right model? Do you ask, if different textbooks have different ones, how can you decide? Do you ask your teacher how to decide this? Now this is where it's being a big deal, teaching at a religious school, right? In religious studies classes, there is a right answer to this question. The way you find out what's true is you look in the Bible. But is that what we do for science class? 
how do you figure out what's right in science class? You do an experiment. Okay, I'm going too slowly for people here. You do an experiment. So here's the experiment we're going to do. You're going to get your, get your filament in as good a focus as you can. And then what you're going to do is you're going to cover up, but not yet, in a moment, you're going to cover up half of the lens with a, a piece of opaque card that's there. What does your model predict will happen to the image when you cover up half of the lens? And I'll suggest that the different models predict different things. So look at the model and see what you think the model will predict will happen. So let's say it's the top half. A lot of people I hear mumbling, remember which side of So it's right, we'll do the side closest to the light bulb and the top half. Don't, you, don't try your experiment yet. Patience, you have to make your predictions before we can try the experiment. Anxious are figuring it out, yes? Isn't this great? Students are on the edge of their seat to do science. All right, so let's give it a try since people are ignoring my instructions and doing it anyway. So cover up half the lens and see if your prediction is true. What did you see happen? Nothing. Nothing? Not even the brightness on the screen? Yeah, it got dimmer. Dimmer. So the intensity went down? How many people thought this was what was going to happen? So indeed, uh, it is surprising that you only get, if any part of the lens is exposed, you get the full image. Kind of amazing. Okay. So which one of these models predicted that? None of these models predict that. It bothers me every time I pick up the Chronicle. Um, and it has that picture of how the eye works. And that model doesn't correctly predict how the eye works. I don't know if that bothers you. It bothers me. It bothers me that the photography textbook is wrong. It bothers me that my high school textbook is wrong. It, it's really cool, though, that I can do an experiment in front of you all to show that those models are at least inadequate, if not, in fact, wrong. And this is what my students get the chance to do, to construct their own knowledge, to build their understanding of the universe through experiments. They write these down. They don't look up the rule out of the textbook. They experience doing these lab activities. And I think that this is the right way to teach science. And I think that for many of you all, you, are, you, know, you came to a science cafe, you want to do science. But I think many of you all found yourself stimulated enough to do experiments. You couldn't even wait to be told it was OK to do the experiment. <laughs> And imagine you are still a curious high school student. This is, I think, the thing that can make students really interested in science and really learn it. Because these are the sorts of experiences that if I came up to a month later, you'd still remember having done this. So this is something that you'll remember, not just today and tomorrow, not just for the test, but with any luck for the rest of your life. So I hope you're enjoying this. Um, and uh, well, you should spend some more time trying to figure out what the right model is. I'll tell you later if you want, but give you some time to work on it while other people are talking.
We are going to go ahead and take a couple minute break. After the break, we're going to come back and we're going to actually talk about education. And during the break, feel free to experiment. The one thing that I ask is you take your food and empty glasses back to the front here, where, near where I am, and put them in the bin. So to help the staff at the Atlas Cafe, order more food and drink. We'll be back in about five minutes. Yeah, during the break, if you want to light your hands on fire, come on up here. If you want to meet the leopard gecko and the corn snake, he's right back there. I'm going to go back to my young man after the break. But we're over on Hayes at Cole. Hay Street at Cole, there's 20 staff, 115 rescued animals, and we're a mobile science laboratory here at Tree Frog Track, so don't be shy, come visit us anytime, 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. And then for your kids, we have a new evening program, every Saturday, 5 to 9, is Tree Frog Time. So they can come by any Saturday, 5 to 9, it's a new deal, we're trying to bring some more work to our staff and more fun to the kids. Okay. Well, this is one of our moms, or kids in high school now, so we started 10 years ago, so some of our kids are now college, high school, and yeah, he's working with Zeke. So thanks for coming right here as the king of uh, the uh, Declan the Corn Snake. Be a stick or a stone at the animals roam and have fun tonight. <laughs> What the heck is that? 